Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 180. Natasha was calmer, but not happier. She not merely avoided all external forms of pleasure, balls, promenades, concerts, and the theaters, but she never laughed without a sound of tears in her laughter. She could not sing. As soon as she began to laugh or tried to sing by herself, Tears choked her. Tears of remorse. Tears at the recollection of those pure times which could never return. Tears of vexation that she should so uselessly have ruined her young life which might have been so happy. Laughter and singing in particular seemed to her like a blasphemy in face of her sorrow. Without any need of self-restraint, no wish to coquette ever entered her head. She said and felt at that time that no man was more to her than Natasya Ivanova, the buffoon. Something stood sentinel within her and forbade her ever to enjoy anything. Besides, she had lost all the old interest of her carefree girlish life that had once been so full of hope. The previous autumn, the hunting, uncle, and the Christmas holidays spent with Nicholas at Ultradano were what she recalled the oftenest and most painfully. What she would not have given to bring back even a single day of that time, but it was gone forever. Her presentiment at the time had not deceived her, that the state of freedom and readiness for any enjoyment would not return again. Yet it was necessary to live on. It comforted her to reflect that she was not better, as she had formerly imagined, but worse, much worse, than anyone else in the world. But this was not enough. She knew that and asked herself, what next? But there was nothing to come. There was no joy in life, yet life was passing. Natasha apparently tried not to be a burden or a hindrance to anyone, but wanted nothing for herself. She kept away from everyone in the house and felt at ease only with her brother Petya. She liked to be with him better than with the others, and when alone with him, she sometimes laughed. She hardly ever left the house, and of those who came to see them was glad to see only one person, Pierre. It would have been impossible to treat her with more delicacy, greater care, and at the same time more seriously than did Count Bazukov. Natasha unconsciously felt this delicacy and so found great pleasure in his society. But she was not even grateful to him for it. Nothing good on Pierre's part seemed to be a comfort to her. It seemed so natural for him to be kind to everyone that there was no merit in his kindness. Sometimes Natasha noticed embarrassment and awkwardness on his part in her presence, especially when he wanted to do something to please her or feared that something they spoke of would awaken memories distressing to her. She noticed this and attributed it to his general kindness and shyness, which she imagined must be the same towards everyone as it was to her. After those involuntary words, that if he were free he would have asked on his knees for her hand and her love, uttered at that moment when she was so strongly agitated, Pierre never spoke to Natasha of his feelings, and it seemed plain to her that those words, which had then so comforted her, were spoken as all sorts of meaningless words are spoken to comfort a crying child. It was not because Pierre was a married man, but because Natasha felt very strongly with him, that moral barrier, the absence of which she had experienced with Karagin, that it never entered her head that the relations between them could lead to love on her part, still less on his, or even to the kind of tender, self-conscious, romantic friendship between a man and a woman, of which she had known several instances. Before the end of the fast of St. Peter, Agrafina Ivanova Belova, a country neighbor of the Rostovs, came to Moscow to pay her devotions at the shrines of the Moscow saints. She suggested that Natasha should fast and prepare for Holy Communion, and Natasha gladly welcomed this idea. 
Despite the doctor's orders that she should not go out early in the morning, Natasha insisted on fasting and preparing for the sacrament, not as they generally prepared for it in the Rostov household, by attending three services in their own house, but as Agrafina Ivanova did, by going to church every day for a week, and not once missing vespers, matins, or mass. The countess was pleased with Natasha's zeal, after the poor results of the medical treatment, in the depths of her heart she hoped that prayer might help her daughter more than medicines, and though not without fear and concealing it from the doctor, she agreed to Natasha's wish and entrusted her to Belova. Agrafina Avanova used to come to wake Natasha at three in the morning, but generally found her already awake. She was afraid of being late for matins. Hastily washing and meekly putting on her shabbiest dress in an old mantilla, Natasha, shivering in the fresh air, went out into the deserted streets lit by the clear light of dawn. By Agrafina Ivanova's advice, Natasha prepared herself, not in her own parish, but in a church where, according to the devout Agrafina Ivanova, the priest was a man of very severe and lofty life. There were never many people in the church. Natasha always stood beside Zbolova in the customary place before an icon of the Blessed Virgin, led into the screen before the choir on the left side, and a feeling, new to her, of humility before something great and incomprehensible, seized her when at that unusual morning hour, gazing at the dark face of the Virgin illuminated by the candles burning before it, and by the morning light falling from the window, she listened to the words of the service which she tried to follow with understanding. When she understood them, her personal feeling became interwoven in the prayers with shades of its own. When she did not understand, it was sweeter still to think that the wish to understand everything is pride, that it is impossible to understand it all, that it is only necessary to believe and to commit oneself to God, whom she felt guiding her soul at these moments. She crossed herself, bowed low, and when she did not understand, in horror at her own vileness, simply asked God to forgive her everything, everything, and to have mercy on her. The prayers to which she surrendered herself, most of all, were those of repentance. On her way home at an early hour, when she met no one but bricklayers going to work or men sweeping the street, and everybody within the house was still asleep, Natasha experienced a feeling new to her, a sense of the possibility of correcting her faults, the possibility of a new clean life and of happiness. During the whole week she spent this way, that feeling grew every day, and the happiness of taking communion, or communing, as Agrafina Ivanova, joyously playing with the word, called it, seemed to Natasha so great that she felt she should never live till that blessed Sunday. But the happy day came, and on that memorable Sunday, when, dressed in white muslin, she returned home after communion, for the first time for many months, she felt calm and not oppressed by the thought of life that lay before her. The doctor who came to see her that day ordered her to continue powders he had prescribed a fortnight previously. She must certainly go on taking them morning and evening, said he, evidently sincerely satisfied with his success. Only please be particular about it. Be quite easy, he continued playfully, as he adroitly took the gold coin in his palm. She will soon be singing and frolicking about. The last medicine has done her a very great deal. She has freshened up very much. The countess, with a cheerful expression on her face, looked down at her nails and spat a little for luck as she returned to the drawing room. And that concludes my reading of chapter 180. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 180 At this point, I excuse you. Guilt's ultimate destination is often tragedy. In Ibsen's The Master Builder, for example, the main character, Halvard Solness, cannot forgive himself for allowing his family house to burn down in the middle of winter. The cold his wife endures due to lack of shelter makes her sick, and her milk, in turn, infects their twin infant, who soon expires thereafter. Halvard cannot forgive himself, because he feels like a crack in the flue that he never got around to fixing is what caused the fire. This guilt estranges him from his wife, and some time later guides him into the affections of a younger woman, Hilda Wangel, who convinces him to overcome his acrophobia by climbing to the top of a towering steeple he has built, where... With an exquisite sense of Scandiaving morosity and irony, he completes the play with an unintentional and terminal swan dive onto the unforgiving street below. Natasha is climbing Halvard's steeple right now. At the opening of today's chapter, her mood hasn't much changed. She's crying a lot, mostly tears of remorse. Something, we're told, 
stood sentinel within her and forbade her every joy. This something is undoubtedly guilt for having betrayed Prince Andrew and having behaved so improperly. Things start to get better for her, however, when a friend from the country, Agrafina Ivanova Belova, arrives in Moscow and suggests that Natasha join her in a fast in preparation for Holy Communion. Natasha, dismissing the doctor's advice, decides to join Agrafina Ivanova at church every single day. She commits wholeheartedly to this spiritual regimen, not missing a single Vespers, Matins, or Mass. It works. Quote, Natasha experienced a feeling new to her, a sense of the possibility of correcting her faults, the possibility of a new clean life and of happiness. End quote. This is an important moment for Natasha, or anyone else really, struggling with guilt and personal failure. The idea is that one must learn from one's mistakes by first examining their behavior critically. Then, once the problem is identified, one must engage in self-forgiveness with an honest eye towards behaving better next time. Daily Meditation Think of the quality of sleep that follows the self-examination. How calm, deep, and unimpeded it must be when the mind has been praised and admonished and its own watchman and censor has taken secret inventory of its own habits. I use this opportunity daily pleading my case at my own court, when the lights are turned out and my wife has become silent, she's aware of my habit, I examine my entire day, going through what I have done and said. I keep nothing hidden from myself. I do not pass over anything. I have nothing to fear from my mistakes when I say, make sure you don't do this anymore. At this point, I excuse you. Seneca, on anger. All right, that concludes my reading and reflection on chapter 180 of War and Peace. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for joining me. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one time donation to PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes. Tomorrow, we will be reading and reflecting on chapter 181. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others. <laughs>